Well, I uh, just finished today this book, The Meaning of Masonry. So whether you're a Mason or not, uh, this is a valuable book. Um, it was, it was um, written in the 1920s, probably. Uh, the record that we have in the front uh, leaf of this book says that the fifth edition was uh, published in 1927. And this is a reprint of that fifth edition. So if, if it reached its fifth edition in 1927, uh, the original work was probably in the early 20s, if not the teens. And so this book is from, you might say, the, the heyday of masonry, uh, the, the, the great fraternal, um, you could say golden age. The golden age of fraternity would have been post-Civil War in this country, um, all the way up until the Great Depression. The Great Depression... Uh, because of the lack of funds, a lot of men had to demit. That is, they, they left their fraternal orders. So you see a dip in membership for the fraternal orders, masonry being chief among them, uh, until you get to the end of World War II. Then you see a, a skyrocketing of, of membership until you get to the late 50s, and it's just been a decline ever since then. So that just gives you a snapshot of where uh, to place, place this book in terms of chronology. Um, it's written by a Wilmhurst. Uh, I take him to be an Englishman. I did not. I did not research his bio, but uh, some certain things that he writes and the way he writes indicates that he's an Englishman. The book is organized into just a few chapters. There's an introduction, which gives you uh, just some preliminary information about Freemasonry. Then three chapters, one each devoted to the, the, uh, the three degrees of the Blue Lodge, one chapter devoted to the Royal Arch, which is an appendant body of Freemasonry, and then one final chapter, which I think is the most valuable, is uh, comparing Freemasonry to its antecedent in the, the uh, Eleusinian Mysteries, which is uh, the mystery schools that existed amongst the Greeks uh, and others until the, uh, the 6th century when uh, such things are suppressed by Justinian in the East. So uh, where to begin? You, you won't learn any secrets from this book. Uh, he's very careful to not, um, not to say a whole lot uh, in terms of specifics, but there are some, there's a general outline given of, um, of the, the, the mythology, the mythos of Hiram of Abif, Hiram the widow's son. And so, um, skipping skipping most of the book, I'm going to talk about the final chapter because I think if you're not a, if you're not a Mason, um, that's going to be your most interesting chapter, the most fruitful chapter. And if you are a Mason, likewise, it'll be the most fruitful chapter because um, if you really want to know about the first three degrees, you pick up something like Duncan's Duncan's Monitor, and you can learn all that you want to know about the first three degrees. But where it gets really interesting is where even in even Masonic um, lectures and even in the degree work, you don't hear much, you could say, elaboration on what these things mean, what the symbols mean, where you get the most precursory and uh, rudimentary explanations for what they mean. According to Wilmhurst, uh, Freemasonry is what Christianity should have been, that Christianity began as a mystery school, and that Christ was much like a, a Persephone, for instance. Persephone um, represents the human soul, is incarnated, you could say, into the lower realm, goes to Hades, and uh, could have come back unscathed, except that she ate three pomegranate seeds and therefore has to remain in the underworld for three months out of the year. Uh, Christ, likewise, is incarnated and um, to pay for the sins of the world, not his own sins. He has to stay in the heart of the earth, in the grave for three days and three nights. And then Hiram Abiff is uh, due to his keeping his oath and keeping the secrets of the word, of the master's word, is uh, killed by three ruffians. And so in each instance, you have this, this Christ figure. Hiram is an analog to Christ. This Christ figure that incarnates into a lower realm 
and is punished or is killed uh, for some variation of three either attackers, like the three, three ruffians, or has to spend three days, or in the case of Persephone, three months in the underworld. And so what these represent ultimately is the sun. These are all analogs for the sun. The sun between December 21st and March 21st is dead. That is, the night is longer than the day. And then the, the, the sun does not reconquer the night for three whole months. And so this is symbolic of the human soul. The human soul is, an, is incarnated into this world. The human soul uh, has partaken of the fruits of this world and therefore has these uh, carnal attachments and these passions that weigh it down and keep it from uh, entering into the realm of the divine and to, uh, to free itself from these, from these earthly passions, from this, uh, from this mortal coil. And so that's what Freemasonry is attempting to do, is attempting to show this perennial sun symbolism that Christianity should have remained as an esoteric uh, mystery religion but ceased to be after, he claims, uh, the, the 6th century, that's the 500s, when Justinian forcibly shut down uh, the schools at Athens, uh, the, the Platonic schools and uh, the Eleusinian mysteries, forcibly shut these down and then enforced uh, Christian orthodoxy over his entire realm. And so Christianity, he says, began as a mystery religion and the greatest of them being, being the, the, the sum of all of them, taking the best of all the mystery religions and incorporating them into one, one faith, and then providing it to everyone um, free of charge, whereas the mysteries before were locked up and, and you, had to, you had to work to gain access to them. The church was fairly open. Orthodoxy and worldly concerns finally makes the church uh, exoteric in its outlook and uh, excludes it from the, you could say, uh, excludes it from the work of the mystery schools to, to bring enlightenment and to bring regeneration to man. Um, he says, Wilmer says that masonry, what, whatever you make of its lineage or where it comes from, its origins, it is necessarily a continuation of the Eleusinian mysteries. He draws some connections there but says that the, the three degrees of initiation are much like, in the Blue Lodge at least, these are like the lesser min, min, uh, mysteries of, the, um, of Eleusis. And he goes on to say something about the Royal Arch, which most modern Masons would not countenance. He says that the Royal Arch really is a degree beyond, a, de a degree system beyond the Blue Lodge, whereas most modern Masons would say, once you've reached the uh, the degree of Master Mason, every other degree is really lateral. Uh, there is no degree beyond that of Master Mason. Uh, Wilmhurst flatly contradicts this and says that the, the Royal Arch is not only beyond and above, but completes the, 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 the mythos of the Blue Degree. So that's an older way of looking at it. That is not how a modern Mason would approach it. But it really is, and according to Wilmhurst, Masonry is a means by which the soul is enlightened, a means by which passions are subdued, and that man can reestablish connection to the divine, to God, to his creator, such that when he dies, he doesn't have to be reincarnated, but he can, he can stay in that realm of bliss. He can stay in that divine realm and, and be with God. Um, so comparisons of Freemasonry to uh, both Catholicism and Judaism. So uh, some of these parallels he draws very plainly in the text, some you have to infer. He says very plainly that the three degrees of initiation in Freemasonry can be likened to the three degrees of initiation in, in the Catholic Church. And so there are three degrees or levels of cleric. You have the deacon, you have the priest, you have the bishop. You also, for the layperson, three degrees of initiation you have in baptism, first communion, and then uh, uh, confirmation. Likewise, reflected in those, those three clerics, because deacons can baptize, but not consecrate the Eucharist. The priest can consecrate the Eucharist, but generally the priest, unless he's been given... Um, unless he's been given a uh, dispensation, the priest does not 
uh, confirm, it's the bishop that confirms. So there are three degrees within Catholicism that's easily uh, seen. Uh, what's not readily seen, and he doesn't explicitly state, but I will say there are three degrees uh, with respect to the temple and even the tabernacle. There's the outer court, which the Gentiles could approach and worship him. And then there's the sanctuary itself that is in, inside the temple where only the Jews could go. And then there's the sanctum sanctorum. That's the Holy of Holies where only one guy could go. And that's the high priest once a year. So the, there are these three degrees of, of approach towards God in the temple. Likewise, there are these three degrees of approach in the life of the Catholic through baptism, first communion and, uh, and uh, confirmation. Likewise, also in the lodge, there are three degrees of initiation, the inner apprentice, the fellow craft, and the master mason's degree. And so all of these, if understood esoterically and not exoterically, can be understood as mystery religions. That is, uh, they hold the mysteries of God for the wise, and they teach uh, exoteric doctrines for the unwise, for the masses. It's not very wise, actually, if you, if you know... If you understand these things very deeply, it's not wise to express them to the to the mass of humanity because in giving pearls to swine, uh, they'll not only – it's not just that they won't understand. They will violently turn against you, and it'll, it'll cause you harm. I'll say one more thing about this book. Uh, the era – as I said, the era in which it was written uh, was considered – the heyday of Freemasonry. And so if you're, if you're involved in Freemasonry or just listen to the, like Freemasonic podcasts online, uh, they've struggled with membership. Like I said, the, the membership peaked in the late fifties. It's been declining ever since. And much of, much of the, the old guard, so to speak, or the boomers, the Gen X largely did not join. And, um, uh, millennials also largely did not join. So you have a smattering of Gen X and millennials, but mostly it's the boomers uh, keeping keeping things running and who have memorized all the all the uh, ritual work. And with their passing, uh, there there will come a crisis, obviously. So. Uh, there, there, it's generally understood that there's a crisis in Freemasonry, not just in uh, numbers, but also in, in uh, uh, you could say, competence, competence to run the organization. I'm not as worried as some people are. Some people, you know, they, for them, this is like Armageddon. I think that there will always be people, there will always be guys who will commit to memory the things that need to be committed to memory. They'll always fill the void. Uh, what they what they do need is a larger body of membership to provide the funds necessary to do the things that they've always done and to maintain the buildings that they've had for a hundred years. But all that aside, if you go back to the the heyday of masonry, so post Civil War all the way up to the Great Depression, the heyday of the fraternities, all the fraternities. So there was more than just Freemasonry. There was the the Loyal Order of the Gardeners. There was um, or the Order of the Eagles, the Moose Lodge that most people are familiar with. Uh, there was uh, also the Odd Fellows. The Order of the Odd Fellows uh, was, in some ways, even bigger than Masonry in some parts of the country. Um, all of these have passed out of existence or have become so small as to be neg negligible at this point. Masonry stands alone for a couple of reasons. But um, what Wilhelm Hurst expresses in this book is that even in the 20s, even in 1927, when the fifth edition came out, he said that most Masons were actually not inclined towards the esoteric. That is, they were not inclined towards the the soul work, the, uh, the spiritual work that the initiatory elements of the craft uh, were geared towards. They were more inclined to maybe memorize the ritual. They were more inclined to treat the fraternity as a club or as a uh, charity. But as far as subduing the passions, trying to rekindle uh, some, some spark of divinity in themselves, preparing themselves for death, um, that work was left to only a few that really understood the ritual, really understood what it meant 
um, what it meant to, you could say, die to self, uh, to be raised again into new life. Um, this book speaks very highly of Christ. Um, and what another thing he says is that masonry, in an attempt to be, to be non-sectarian, and if, he, if we're going to be very explicit, in an attempt to be more palatable to Jewish members, has deliberately concealed and veiled um, the New Testament and uh, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has his analog in Hiram, but otherwise the New Testament is not very much referenced. And he says that this is actually a mistake, that Jesus is uh, the analog of Hiram, that much of the New Testament is exactly uh, Freemasonic doctrine, and much, much that is in the New Testament in terms of doctrine is even put in Freemasonic language. And so what Freemasonry is, ultimately, according to Wilmhurst, is all that the church should have been, except that Freemasonry has failed even to become what it was intended to be by its founders, that it is, by and large, much like the church, uh, very exoteric. The people take on its face value what they see with their eyes. They never apply it internally to the inward man. So that's an interesting observation. Um, so anybody that says that there was a golden age, Wilmhurst would disagree. Uh, just when you think there should have been a golden age for fraternities, he's saying that actually most Masons are not worthy of, of the title and haven't truly understood their initiation. So, um, yeah, there are no golden ages. I don't care what you're talking about. If you're talking about... Uh, American politics, if you're talking about the Catholic Church, if you're talking about uh, Freemasonry, um, there, there are no golden ages that everyone from every age decries the age that they're in, and they all harken back to some prior time when things were better. And you can just, you can just do that indefinitely, um, infinite regression backwards. Literally everyone's complaining about the same thing forever. So things change. Uh, things do need to change currently. They'll change slowly because the old guard uh, see things very differently and they have a very different mode of existence. Um, in, another, in another podcast I was listening to, somebody, somebody lamented that uh, Freemasonry is very much for uh, the retiree that the, the demands that it places on the individual are so in contradiction to uh, the demands of family life that the only people who can comfortably engage with Freemasonry uh, to the degree um, demanded, to the degree demanded by its hierarchy, that is, if you go to every meeting, if you go to every stated meeting, every called meeting, uh, you would probably end up alone. Like your, your wife wouldn't tolerate it. It really is for the, the retiree, the empty nester, and the divorcee. I'll say that too, that if you're divorced, it would work well for you. If you have nothing, but, if you have nothing else but work, pulling on your, your time and resources, then masonry works well. It's very hard to take part in today um, if you have a lot of household responsibilities, a lot of family ties. So that's a problem that will have to be addressed in the future, I will not be the one to fix it. I'm just one man. But um, if you're interested in Freemasonry, Wilmhurst's book, The Meaning of Masonry, is what it's titled, if I, if I failed to mention that. The Meaning of Masonry was a book that was given to, uh, historically given to every, every third degree Mason, every master Mason upon his being raised. And as such, there are probably tens of thousands of copies of this floating around the country. I picked this up for a song. Uh, it doesn't give away any secrets at all whatsoever. So uh, the, the non-Mason can pick it up and not spoil the experience. And even, even the Mason can pick it up and hand it to a friend or, or read it aloud and not give away any secrets. And so that's, that's the beauty of the book. Uh, it tells a lot without telling, uh, without telling the, um, the more explicit portions. So uh, give it some thought. Um, I'm sure you can think of something to put in the comments. I don't normally tell people to do this, uh, but if you like the video, you help to beat the algorithm. Um, I even hesitate to say that because I kind of don't care. I kind of like anonymity and I kind of like 
having a very small cohort and a very small audience. But if you hit the like button or you make a comment, you help to beat the algorithm. And that always feels good to beat the beat the algorithm because the algorithm is not fair. So uh, I'll probably have something more to say soon, um, next couple of days, or even tonight if I stay up late enough.